Hey, it's Mike here, and today, Plandemic's top five claims scientifically analyzed. With maybe, maybe I'll throw a bonus one in there. If you don't know, Plandemic is a viral documentary, pun completely and shamelessly intended, that has sort of taken the internet by storm in terms of the controversy especially. It was taken down from YouTube due to the inaccurate claims YouTube said it made. That then played perfectly into the feeling that there was a conspiracy afoot. Oops. But this was part one of a documentary, and it was mainly interviewing a woman named Judy Mikovits, who makes some really, really incredible claims regarding HIV, Ebola, Anthony Fauci, and probably most importantly here, COVID-19, which we will mainly focus on. We really need to examine these claims because our personal behaviors depend on our beliefs. And so when you get claims like, Oh, actually the virus isn't that big of a deal and doctors have worked together to inflate the numbers of cases and deaths to make more money. We need to know if that's true. All right, let's go. Firstly, what are my motivations as a person? Well, I am a master's in public health student and I have made several coronavirus videos. At least four have immediately had ads taken off of them and I've continued to make them at a cost to me. I have not taken pharmaceutical money and I do not know Dr. Fauci. And before I get to point number one, I just wanna have a really quick heart to heart if that is such a thing and just say that if you believe in this documentary you have probably been called stupid and uneducated and probably had a, a little bit of a tiff with some people that you know and I know a lot of people who I personally respect who have bought into this documentary and I think that is so possible because it launches off of a foundation of real documented flaws within our medical system. I mean, just insulin prices in our country versus neighboring countries is insane enough. The corporate control of our medical system is documented and honestly deplorable, that is valid. And then no single person would have the resources to immediately fact check every single claim of this documentary as they watch it. But what we need to do is separate that valid launch pad that everybody can connect with from the very outlandish claims that are made in the movie. And we're gonna do that by fact checking, scientifically and logically fact checking some of the most important claims. And I also wanna shift people's perspective a little bit because the way that ideas are presented in a documentary can be really convincing. But then if I were to just walk up to you on the street and make some of these claims, what would you think? Hi, I'm a scientist that played a major role in the discovery of the virus behind AIDS, HIV, but Dr. Fauci decided to block that discovery to make money for his friends. Hey, we have a drug that instantly cures autism, but corporations don't want you to know about it. Side note, that would be like a billion dollar drug. Come on, you know they would be trying to push that. Hey there, Ebola was made in a lab. Also, the coronavirus was made in a lab by Fauci so that he could get rich off creating a vaccine. Also, if they were so prepared for all this, why, why don't they have the vaccine yet? All right, we're almost to point number one, but I just wanna say I don't wanna spend too much time on this whole backstory of her personally, her paper on chronic fatigue that was withdrawn, any of those large governmental conspiracy aspects particularly. We're just gonna examine the scientific validity of some of her main claims, and I have just come out of a research fugue state, and this is the first time I actually have a visibly bloodshot eye, so <laughs> let's go. Point number one. COVID deaths are being exaggerated so doctors can make more money. The implication here is that the virus is not that big of a deal, but the reason we see high numbers like we do is because doctors will get paid by classifying more cases and particularly deaths as COVID-19. I've talked with doctors who have admitted that they are being incentivized to list patients that are sick or have died with COVID-19. Yeah, $13,000 for Medicare if you call it COVID-19. Why are we being pressured to add COVID to maybe increase the numbers and make it look a little bit worse than it is? But there's a major Achilles heel to this claim, and that is if we were just taking the normal death rate and taking a slice out of that and naming it COVID-19, then we wouldn't be seeing a significantly higher death rate than our normal background rate. That these 70,000 COVID deaths that we've had so far would just be misclassified deaths and the rate would be the same. Well, it might actually be the opposite that we have undercounted some COVID-19 deaths. And from this preliminary paper, quote, the increase in all cause deaths in New York and New Jersey is one and a half to three times higher than the official tally of COVID-19 confirmed deaths. So we have an unaccounted for spike in deaths in that area. And also in California, where at one point they just had 101 deaths from COVID 
but about 400 more deaths than normal from pneumonia and flu that weren't classified as COVID. And specifically, her and others in the documentary claim that these deaths were being taken from normal COPD deaths or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease deaths, as well as normal pneumonia deaths. Well, the normal rate of COPD deaths hangs around, you know, a little less than 450 a day. Let's be generous, say 450 a day. And don't smoke, because eight out of 10 of those are from smoking. And then as a category, pneumonia and flu are combined at around 150 deaths a day. So very generously, we're looking at a cap of misapplied deaths toward COVID that couldn't be more than 600 deaths a day from these causes. So how did we have 2,500 COVID deaths on May 6th? And how have we been averaging roughly 2,000 deaths a day for quite some time now? And by contrast, our leading killer in the US heart disease kills around 1,770 people per day. That's a lot of deaths, and you're probably only two degrees of separation away from somebody who has died from this. I know I am. And to keep it morbid, the final nail in the coffin is that hospitals across the US are facing bankruptcy, which is ridiculous, and that's from the lack of normal patients coming in from closing services or people being afraid to come in due to COVID. I mean, just imagine being a doctor, going to work every day, putting your life in danger, probably knowing some colleagues that have died and then people come at you and accuse you of this. Anyway, on to point number two. SARS-2 was made from SARS-1 in a laboratory. And this is where I really particularly wanna start examining her scientific claims in particular because her as an authority figure in the documentary, you know, and being called one of the most accomplished scientists of her generation, sort of hinges a bit on her making scientifically accurate claims. So let's see how she does. So it's very clear this virus was manipulated. If it was a natural occurrence, it would take it up to 800 years to occur. This occurred from SARS-1 within a decade. That's not, that's not naturally occurring. She says that SARS-CoV-2, the current coronavirus we're concerned about, must have been made in a lab from SARS-1 because for that naturally to evolve, it would have taken 800 years. Don't know where that number came from. This shows a disturbing lack of basic knowledge about SARS viruses in general. And to show that, let's look at the sort of genetic tree of SARS. You can see that SARS-2 absolutely did not evolve directly from SARS-1. Yeah, they have a common ancestor, but let me put it this way. I'm sorry, COVID. SARS-1 is not your daddy. If COVID went on the Maury show, this Judy lady would absolutely be shocked by the paternity test. So it wasn't called SARS coronavirus 2 because it was the immediate child of SARS-1. It was because it was another coronavirus that resulted in SARS or severe acute respiratory syndrome. And it absolutely could be naturally occurring when you consider that bats have a crazy accelerated immune system that leads to all sorts of disease harboring, that pangolins are the most trafficked mammal on the planet, which could have been a reservoir. And also that the wild animal farming industry in China is a $70 billion farming industry. That is a massive amount of contact between humans and animals that could have infected them. It's also not an insane jump when other coronaviruses in these animals are genetically 99% similar. So I'm gonna once again echo the experts from across the world in their Lancet paper that this virus has a natural origin. This is probably the most important point of this video for two reasons. One, because if we continue to deny the animal origin of this disease and diseases like it, we're probably gonna fail to prevent the next one. And number two, it really is the thesis of the movie Plandemic that this was all planned and made in a lab. But when you get scientific facts like this completely wrong, it sort of takes away some credibility. And the next claim is right along the same lines and we're gonna hit it pretty quickly. Number three, that Ebola was also made in a lab. In 1999, I was working in Fort Detrick in USAMRID there and my job was to teach Ebola how to infect human cells without killing them. Ebola couldn't infect human cells until we took it in the laboratories. If I'm correct in interpreting her story, she was saying that in the late 90s, she worked in a lab that was injecting human cells with Ebola, which allowed it to evolve to affect humans. And the problem, once again, with extreme scientific inaccuracy is that number one, Ebola was discovered in the 70s, specifically 1976 in a human. Now, this occurred in Africa, and so if I were to sum up the amount of time 
between when this was discovered in animals and when Ebola was discovered in humans, it would be exactly zero because the original discovery was in humans. And looking back on it genetically, it appears it also came from bats and sadly, again, it could have been, could have been a case of people eating bat soup once again. I cannot believe, can we just make this illegal globally? Yes, let's, let's do that. Batman agrees, it's settled. All right, now we're gonna hop back onto that coronavirus topic because it's so important. And also I wanna mention it's not just her that is responsible for all of this. The interviewer, the creator of the documentary, I believe is very much egging her on, leading her in many cases, and then also choosing other experts that share the opinion that for example, social distancing is misguided. And that again, this virus isn't that big of a deal. Anyway, another claim that she makes though, Number four, hydroxychloroquine is the most effective treatment for COVID. And also of course that it is being suppressed. But my question is, how is it that the virus is simultaneously not that big of a deal, yet the cure for it is so important in being suppressed? We know that hydrochloroquine and zinc are working great for patients. And then Fauci comes out and says, well, there's no double blind controlled placebo study. In a survey polling nearly 2,300 doctors in some 30 countries, hydroxychloroquine was ranked as the most effective medication to treat the virus. Well, now we are starting to get some research on this and it's not looking good from this preliminary paper in late April. No, the drug did not help keep people off of ventilators and also quote, an association of increased overall mortality was identified in patients treated with hydroxychloroquine alone. So sorry, this is not the cure and her paradigm once again doesn't make sense. If you have this cure, it, it's very similar to having the vaccine. You can make a ton of money off this. Every single person pretty much would be buying it off you if it really did help, but you're trying to hide it. I don't know. All right, the fifth claim is that social distancing is bad because microbial diversity. You're, not you're not the first virologist who has told me that we're doing the exact opposite of what we should be doing to contain and to create immunity from this virus. Why would you close the beach? You've got sequences in the soil, in the sand. You've got healing microbes in the ocean, in the salt water. Mikevitz and random chiropractors and other people faces pop up throughout the documentary saying that, oh, actually it's better to be out and exposed to diversity so that you can get a stronger immune system. She says that you should be exposed to sand in the beach. Other people say that you should be exposed to other people more. First of all, you can still go outside and roll in the dirt, just do it six feet apart. But secondly, this is another situation where they're launching off a pretty well-founded principle that diverse exposure to microbes is good, especially though for bacteria, where for example, if you have a strep infection, you might have a better chance of fighting it if you have a lot of bacteria that can outcompete it. But this is a virus which is A, not alive, and B, extremely small. I don't think competition is gonna work in the same way. Like for example, me giving you Ebola or another virus isn't gonna help you fight COVID. And looking historically, we were tribal creatures that probably had tribes of a few dozen people. Yeah, it was probably good to be interacting with each other, touching each other, getting microbes, but you know, people who live in cities of millions of people are probably not gonna do better going out and getting exposed to everything in all cases. And even looking back, you know, I don't think people would be better off if they just purposefully went out and exposed themselves to bubonic plague, for example. So I don't think this holds up as a good argument against social distancing. I mean, look at a place like Sweden that hasn't been doing that to the same extent and their mortality, their death rate is significantly higher than the surrounding Norse countries. Also, there are a lot of comments about how masks make it worse, trap viruses and things like that. I'm planning on doing a mask video, so I'm just actually gonna leave that point out of this and you can maybe subscribe if you wanna catch it in the future. Now that I have scientifically and logically hopefully demonstrated that her claims have been false in many cases, I think it's good to actually examine the arc of her story and the documentary in general. Is it a coincidence that she is telling a story that A, paints herself as the unsung hero of AIDS, and B, appeals to a decades old upper governmental collusion story that cannot be fact-checked? C, that the conclusions of the documentary perfectly and intoxicatingly appeal to our frustrations right now of being locked up Never in the documentary was there a conclusion that was inconvenient to your emotions. And then D, that she also happens to be selling a book. Anyway, I just had to say that. 
In conclusion, COVID death rates are not being inflated by a cabal of doctors because our death rates are higher. We may have been missing some COVID death rates. SARS-2 did not evolve directly from SARS-1. It is well within the realm of normal and natural evolution. No, Ebola was not made in a lab as well. It wasn't even originally discovered in animals. We discovered it in humans first. I don't know how she could make that claim. And then there are just major logical inconsistencies in terms of the motives of this sort of dark upper governmental organization or Fauci in general. You know, he's doing all this so he can sell you a vaccine, yet he's sitting on an instant cure for autism that would make billions of dollars. The antiviral drug, 100 year old drug called Suramin. It literally gave kids with autism a voice, a life. And for a final, final bonus point, there was a point where the documentary creator claimed that her AIDS paper revolutionized the way that we treat AIDS. Her 1991 doctoral thesis revolutionized the treatment of HIV AIDS. Well, Science Magazine has actually stepped in and responded directly to this by saying her paper had no discernible impact on the treatment of HIV slash AIDS. All right, there's so much more I still wasn't even able to cover, which I could cover more. And while I'm happy to say that I did bring my own points to the table, major thank you to all of the people out there who are very probably similar to you in terms of their lives who went and fact checked all of this and put their sources out there. And that really helped me create this video. And also say out of respect for people who really believed in this documentary, I really held back on some of the low hanging fruit green screen jokes that I could have made, but but it's over now, so why not? So in that moment, as Fauci was running away with your AIDS discovery in his pocket, his form slipped for a moment, and that's when you realize that he is a... He's a, a douche? You realize that he is a... No, I got this, I got this. The love of my life. An, an elephant, what? He's a reptilian, damn it, Judy. Hey, mister, that's Plandemic Part 2. Shh. Okay, okay, I'm sorry, back to my mantra. Turn off the narcissism, fake the empathy. Turn off the narcissism, fake the empathy. Okay, I'm ready for the next shot. All right, that's it for today. Feel free to like and subscribe, notification bell if you want future videos, and definitely share the video in discussions about this. Hopefully it will help. All right, thanks for watching.